This is the New Age Cannabis Podcast, a podcast where we take a fresh look at all things cannabis from an African perspective. Join us and our awesome guests as we talk through all the endless capabilities and benefits of cannabis. On today's episode, we'll be looking into the legal issues around cannabis in South Africa and what steps we can take to make a difference. Our guest today is Andrew Laurie, an associate in the Medicinal and Recreational Cannabis Department at Schindler's Attorneys. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks for having me. Welcome. So tell us, what brought you to the plant and what brought you to the department that you're working in? Well, my journey with cannabis started like many others, uh, recreationally. Um, But anyone who enjoys cannabis for long enough soon learns that there's, there's something more there. There's something more than just getting high and having fun and giggles and munchies and all the rest of it. There's something they're worth fighting for. Um, and I just happened to find myself at the right firm at the right time, and I was given an opportunity to explore the question, what can I do? And I've been exploring, exploring it ever since. It's been a lot of fun. Okay. Legislation on cannabis in South Africa has been highly contested and very confusing. What would you say the current state of the legislation is? So the current, it's actually a lot more black and white um, than people like to think. The narrative that it's this big confusing thing with endless grey areas is, is generally being pushed by people who can't accept the reality that we can't sell cannabis yet. Um, so they will push the narrative that it's confusing. But the current state of cannabis law in South Africa is unfortunately geared towards regulating the plant itself and people's relationship, the private relationship with the plant, as opposed to opening up an industry, right? So the cannabis bill is a, a prime example. It's, it's got all these crazy limits of how much we can share, how much we can grow, how much we can do X, Y, and Z with, um, but nothing on industry, nothing on sale. In fact, it outright prohibits the sale of seeds in a context where we're all allowed to grow it and smoke it for ourselves. It's crazy. Um, so ca- the cannabis law space, unlike any other, um, exemplifies a massive disconnect between government and civil society. Um, I mean, that's, that's present everywhere, but I'd, I'd say the most so in, within the cannabis law. In one of your previous posts, I believe it was the Cannabis Expo, the Canna Expo 2019, you referred to some ruling that mm-hmm. was expected in September 2020. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Could you please break down the situation that we're in right now, including the impact of COVID? Sure, no problem. Um, so what I would have been referring to back then is the constitutional court judgment they gave parliament two years from that date so september 2020 uh, to sort of code the judgment into our law so there's a division of powers in south africa we have the executive the judiciary and the legislature right so the judiciary constitutional court um, made rulings on the law and declared them unconstitutional certain laws Um, it then falls to the legislature being the lawmakers to then as i say code that that ruling into our law so What we were expecting from them is they needed to change the Medicines and Related Substances Control Act as well as the Drugs and Drug Trafficking Act um, in order to allow adults to consume, cultivate, possess cannabis um, in private for personal consumption. So to the extent that those laws didn't allow for that, they needed to be changed. Um, The Medicines Act was changed fairly quickly by the Minister of Health. The Minister of Health is empowered in terms of the Medicines Act to make changes to the scheduling. Um, So they removed cannabis from Schedule 7 and they put THC in Schedule 6 and CBD in Schedule 4 and then subject to certain requirements CBD can also be Schedule 0. So that sort of takes care of the medical, medical side of things. The Drugs and Drug Trafficking Act is where our criminal sanctions are. Um, So right now, the Cannabis Bill seems to be Parliament's response to that. So the Cannabis Bill proposes that cannabis be removed from the Drugs and Drug Trafficking Act and then it'll be regulated in terms of the Cannabis Bill. Um, So that was what we were expecting. Uh, The Cannabis Bill right now is open for for public comment um, until I think the end of this month and then it closes. Um, But COVID didn't really have an impact, Uh, aside from slowing things down as it does. Um, it didn't have any kind of special effect on, on the laws. Um, so yeah, so that's where we are. Oh, thanks for that information, Andrew. So in terms of legislation, as has been proposed in the current bill, what's your view in terms of how government is looking to code, as you said, code cannabis into uh, the legislation? And how do you think we can help them 
get it in a way that allows everyone to actually participate in the cannabis industry once it does come online. Yeah, so I referred earlier to a bit of a disconnect between what government thinks they should do with cannabis and what civil society thinks they should do with cannabis. And bear in mind that the whole charge on cannabis right now is, is led by civil society and there's a, there's a good reason for that. Uh, so there's a lot in that. Um, the, the bill only has to address the, uh, the constitutional court judgment. It doesn't have to go further in what that judgment allows for. And that judgment doesn't allow for things like industry. That's not to say that legislature couldn't have gone there, they just chose not to. Um, so how we can help them, right now the bill is open for public comments. Uh, we as Schindlers have submitted comments, we've asked if we can address them in person, we'll see what they say. Um, but right now that, that's all we can do, we can submit comments uh, as civil society. But right now the, the bill, it only seeks to regulate cannabis in the private sense, right? So it's not talking about industry and stuff, it's talking about what you and I can do in our day-to-day -day lives with cannabis. And it expends far too much time and effort on that. It, it, it goes into far too much detail about how many grams of this and that you can have and how many milligrams of extract equals a gram of dried flour. They make all these equivalents and everything like that. My question is who is going to police all of this? Are all of our police going to be issued scales and, and, and given uh, brief lessons in chemistry and so on? Why? why? Why are we wasting so much time and effort worrying about what the private person does in his private time? With cannabis, I mean the the age-old question that I think was coined by Myrtle Clark from Fields of Green for All: Who's counting my whiskey, <laughs> and why do you care? <laughs> so I don't know why uh, a completely different standard is, is set for cannabis right now. Um, what 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 I will say about the bill is that it does allow for subsequent legislation to come out and grant us further freedoms, further rights with cannabis. So um, notionally, there could be a recreational cannabis bill that comes up next um, that would then expand our well, sorry, for, lift the ban on, for example, the sale of seeds or the, the sale of cannabis uh, subject to you know, certain licensing requirements and stuff. Um, the problem is with legislation like that, is, as we've seen, it, it takes a long, long time. And in the interim, we'll, we'd be left with that bill. And the bill, for example, I mean, it, it sets a limit on how much cannabis I'm allowed to share with you, right? I'm allowed to share, I'm allowed to give you up to 100 grams. If I give you 300 grams, I go to jail for 15 years. What happens if I want to give you 100 grams three times? <laughs> I mean, who's counting this, yeah. you know what I mean? How could you possibly monitor that? Mm. Um, and again, it, it's the, the ban on seeds is outrageous. Uh, we're all allowed to smoke it and grow it and enjoy it, but we can't buy seeds. We're expected to give it to each other for free. That's unfortunately not sustainable. That's not how business works. Um, so how can we, outside of the bill, I guess, keep putting pressure on government as just civil society in South Africa has been doing very well. Um, they got civil society got the constitutional court judgment. The government didn't wake up one day and decide to give us freedom for cannabis. That was done by ordinary people. Um, so there's a lot that we can do. We just need to keep fighting for the correct way. <laughs> um, get good lawyers <laughs> and drive it home, and, and and let's see what happens. I mean, there's a lot of exciting stuff that will be happening next year in the cannabis space um, that I can't go into too much detail about yet, but. We'll let you know when we can. <laughs> so I think just a, a bit of a, a side question from that. Yeah. Uh, I know that one of the um, regulations proposed in the bill is, for example, if you are found smoking in your car, automatically four years. So with what you've mentioned and, and those other sorts of um, uh, punitive measures or punishments within the bill, what sort of burden would the state resources actually be under in order to actually, uh, uh, if that bill goes through, to actually execute that bill? Because I can imagine it would take, like you said, getting police officers scales, but where else in the legal value chain would it be affected, I guess in a negative way, because then that means more taxes would need to go towards fighting something that yeah. doesn't need to be fought. So, so the bill imposes an unnecessary degree of complexity onto what should otherwise be quite a simple set of laws. So because there are so many different limits, um, limitations on how much cannabis we can have in a certain context, you know, there's different limits on how much you can carry through a public space, how much you can possess in private, how much you can have in your car, um, how much you can share, how many seeds you can have. All of these numbers will confuse the police, firstly, um, and when police see vagueness in the law, they take advantage of it, and they will end up just as you may know, arresting people for <laughs> arbitrary amounts of, of cannabis. I mean, they, they will think, you know, the rule must exist somewhere. So they'll see it and they'll go for it. Um, with uh, a step above that in court, um, again, it, it, it creates so much room 
to impose sentences on people. Um, there, there's too many rules to keep track of for both civil society, for law enforcement, and um, for the for, sorry the judiciary. Um, there's too many technicalities. There's too many ways it could go, and it's whenever there's vagueness like this, there's massive room for injustice. And it takes a lot of time and a lot of resources to try and navigate through um, terrain like that. So the, the complexity is the problem. The complexity is going to allow police to abuse it. It's going to allow the judiciary to misinterpret it. It's going to confuse you and me. And that's who it's supposed to be for. So that's the kind of pressure it puts on unnecessary kind, the unnecessary kind. Yeah. Okay, yeah. thanks for that. Okay, Andrew, in the number of years that you've been working, what is the silliest case you've ever encountered as a lawyer in the cannabis space? Yeah, so that one, it, it's silly for different reasons. It was a defamation case that we launched against the state. So our clients, the duck couple at the time, uh, a member of state came, came out on the radio and said that they profit from selling cannabis to school children, which is def it's textbook defamation. I mean, if I was to think of it as a law lecturer, like off the top of my head, if I needed to throw out an example for defamation, then that would be it. Like it was, it was clear cut. Um, the state came in, their lawyers behaved like they were in a circus. I mean, the, the evidence they were throwing at our clients was they were showing pictures of our clients standing in cannabis fields. And then it didn't take long for the judge to realize that these pictures were taken in Canada and that those were legal cannabis fields. But they were still saying, look, they must sell this to children. Um, and we thought we were winning and we had every reason to believe that and it went against us. The, <laughs> the, the, judgment. Ju the judgment went against mm -hmm. us. The, they found that because the, our clients are public figures, they should have thicker skin. I mean, I don't know if, if, you know, if you're a public figure, can I go and say you profit from selling drugs to, to kids? I don't know. It's, yeah. So it's, it's silly in a different way. It's, it just it shows kind of the prejudice that is faced by members of the cannabis community. I mean, because you operate in that space, the rules are not different for you. Your public mm -hmm. figures, when it suits you, and the government, sorry, when it suits the court, they're not public figures. However, when they're trying to fight for the rights of the ordinary cannabis user, they're criminals. <laughs> so which one are they? Public figures or criminals? It just seems to be um, that whatever label fits the agenda is the one that gets imposed. So mm -hmm. it's, it's silly for the wrong reasons. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's uh, shocking. Yeah. <laughs> to say least, but okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> cool. Next question, Akun. All right. Which country in the world right now is the closest in getting the cannabis legislation correct? Yeah, so the, the answer might surprise you. I, I think it's South Africa. Um, the, the reason is our cannabis regime is so unique in the sense that it was created by civil society. Uh, we didn't wake up one day and uh, to a cannabis act. We didn't wake up one day um, when out of the blue the states had already decided to capture the cannabis industry by imposing legislation that they wrote while we were sleeping. We fought for it. We went to court. Um, and we were successful. We unlocked freedoms that we never had before. No modern South African has ever experienced the freedoms that civil society was able to unlock through the constitutional court. Um, so we have momentum on our side. Now we have precedent from the highest court in the land on our side. Uh, government right now is reacting to what civil society is doing. They're not being proactive, they've been reactive. So if we don't like their reactions, then we just go back to court. So um, I'm optimistic about our ability to challenge any laws we don't like in court on the basis of the constitutional court judgment. It's a, it's a ammunition that not many other countries have. Mm. Yeah. So Andrew, what direction would you like to see the legislation go in terms of cannabis in the South African context and also continentally in terms of the African context, mm. especially if we look at the free trade agreement that's actually recently been, been ratified by the biggest economy in Nigeria, yeah. which will basically open up the commercial borders across the continent. How do you think cannabis can fall into that? What do you think would be the right way for it to be legislated for that to have a positive impact? Yeah, so the, the answer is surprisingly simple. Um, it involves a lot less effort than is, than is currently being put into restricting cannabis. So it's an example that has sort of surfaced in my time at Schindler's. Um, I can grow as many hops and barley as I want, right? I can even in the privacy of my own home combine those hops and barley with yeast and water and I can make beer. I can make as much beer as I want for myself. The minute I want to sell that beer, I need a liquor license, right? So why is it different with cannabis? Why can I not grow and use it and share it as much as I want in a private context? As soon as I want to sell it and I want to make certain claims about it, 
then I should be able, I should have to get a license, um, not a res un unduly restrictive license, something that just proves that it's met certain safety standards, mm. um, safety and quality standards, right? And then if I want to, for example, sell my cannabis to the medical industry, then I have to meet even more stringent safety and quality standards and so on and so forth. But in the private context where it's just us having fun, um, any kind of regulation of that is a ginormous waste of time and resources. <laughs> so it's uh, regulate the uses as opposed to the plant. It's a very simple mantra um, and an effective one. As I said, it's, it's so much less effort. Yeah. Um, the, the cannabis bill shouldn't have to exist at all. I mean, you ask, people ask me what changes I'd make to, it, to tear it up, to throw it away, it's useless. <laughs> it causes more problems than it solves. <laughs> quite true. It's, it's almost like saying, okay, if you want to grow rosemary at, rosemary at home, we're going to regulate it. Yeah. For what purpose I'm mm. growing rosemary sure. at home? But if I then say to the world, my rosemary cures cancer, they should, I should have to get it tested and I should have to get a license that proves that. And if you want to sell it, you should also get a license to yeah. show that you followed the right yeah. um, procedures to make sure there's no pesticides and all those other sort yeah. of health and public benefit uh, issues. Exactly. So, so government's efforts right now are, are misdirected. They're focusing so much on what we do with it in our private time and not paying any attention to simply creating a licensing regime. And that's, that's all you need. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. So in that respect, what rights or what set of rights should cannabis consumers know? Oh, yes, so um, I used to tell people what rights they should know and now there's a more valuable piece of advice because it's the question we get asked the most. Selling cannabis and cannabis seeds is still illegal. You can't sell them, all right? And no matter how much you try and dress the transaction up, the courts are smart. They're smart people. They will cut through that transaction and they will see on the one hand money and the other hand cannabis and a change of ownership taking place. So what people will try and do is say, I will sell you Rizzler um, or I will sell you a subscription to a newsletter. And then a week after that transaction, you get free cannabis. All right. The, the fact that money and cannabis are in the same transaction, it doesn't matter how many steps you remove one from the other, the court will cut through those steps and just focus on, as I say, change of ownership, cannabis, money, you're dealing. Um, so uh, it's the question we get asked the most. What if I sell a newsletter and give you free cannabis? It's, you're not selling the newsletter, you're selling the cannabis, we all know it. <laughs> yeah. So don't get clever. <laughs> don't get clever, we're not dealers here. Yeah. <laughs> we're not advocating for anyone to be a dealer. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So what resources would you recommend for people to review and learn more about cannabis yeah. and the cannabis legislation in South Africa? Yeah, so a bit of, bit of a soft plug for my firm, but uh, if you go onto the Schindler's Attorney's website and go to our medicinal and recreational cannabis page, we actually upload quite regularly um, very helpful resources that will yeah, it'll get you, get you to where you need to be as an ordinary citizen in terms of the cannabis laws. There's a document on there called The State of Play um, that covers exactly where we are, including what the bill might do. So have a read of that. It's like eight pages. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So if you want to know, have a read. <laughs> Absolutely. <Yeah. laughs> so where can people find you socially or for legal advice? Yeah, so the, the easiest way to contact us is uh, by emailing cannabis at shindlers.co.za. Um, there's a team of five of us that that email will go to, uh, we'll, we'll respond and we'll, uh, we'll get you where you need to be. <laughs> yeah. And on the socials? Uh, socials, I uh, don't really use them too much for business, but I mean, if you want to see what I get up to in my private time, it's Andrew underscore lawyer. So <laughs> Thank you so much, Andrew, for coming on the show. I think we've learned a lot. Yes, I think the information that you've given sheds a lot of light into the so-called grey areas that used to exist. So hopefully people listening to this will be better equipped to engage the cannabis industry, whether it be from a legal or commercial standpoint going forward. Yeah. That's my hope too. Yeah, thanks for having me guys. Anytime really. Yeah. And thank you to our listeners and our viewers. We are because of you. Remember to subscribe to our channel for more updates on the New Age Cannabis Podcast. Links and info in the description box below. Bye. Ciao. Sala Sintle. Etre. More languages or not languages. Wow. Ciao. It's Portuguese. I've got a few more. I don't know how. Au revoir. There we go, French. Wow. <laughs>